Well, I don't know what to think about that. I get up to preach and Terry walks out. <laughs> I want to begin this evening by telling you how wonderful of a congregation I believe you to be. I looked around and I, I kind of like to watch people. You ever go to a, a mall and just sit there and watch people? I like to do that because I sure don't like to shop with my wife. So I'll go there and I'll sit while she does her thing. You know, my wife can shop all day long and not buy a stinking thing. Do you guys know something about that? But anyway, I've been watching y'all and y'all seem to really care and love one another. I can see here a real family working together. And I know that uh, Terry and Melissa are, think very highly of you. And evidently, by the way you've cared for them, I know you think very highly of them. And so it's just wonderful to have a good Christian place to worship. So what I got to say is, keep up the good work. Okay, that's my sermon for the night. We'll see you tomorrow night. <laughs> now... I got more to say to you than that. Our theme for this series of lessons is the church moving forward. And our theme is found in Philippians chapter 3. We're looking at verses 13 to 14 where it says, Brethren, I count not myself yet to have laid hold, but one thing I do, Forgetting the things which are behind and stretching forward to the things which are before I press on to the goal unto the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. As we mentioned this morning, Paul believed in moving ahead. He did not want to be involved in falling back. He did not want to rely upon past laurels. He says, forgetting the things that are past, whether they be good or bad, but he's going to press forward. He believed that we should not be satisfied where we presently are, but we need to be moving forward. If you don't get anything else out of this series of lessons, I hope you get this. We should never individually or congregationally be satisfied with where we are. We need to improve every day. With this in mind, I want you to consider how the Lord describes His church as a body both in its life and also in its function. In Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, it says, For even as we have many members in one body, and all the members have not the same office, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and severally members one of another. Bodies are designed to live, to act, and to work. Physical bodies function in such a way that life today promotes life tomorrow. How you take care of yourself today is going to play a big part in how you are tomorrow, right? Shake or nod, right? And how you took care of yourself when you were younger plays a big part in how you are today, right? But you know the same is true in the Lord's church. What we do today is going to promote life. Tomorrow. 
I know that many of you know this. I know that Terry knows this. But there are enemies of the body. There are enemies that damage the body. There are enemies that can kill the body. There are diseases. There are accidents. You ever do something dumb? It was the other day I was uh, up on a ladder working and it was a tall it was one of those six foot you know step ladders and I was up there I was working I got down well I got up on another ladder thinking it was still the same six foot ladder but it's one of those short jobbies right there and I leaned over like I was on a six foot ladder and my face hit the concrete could have been a lot worse but there are accidents that affect the body, right? Sometimes because we do dumb stuff. But likewise, in the church, there are enemies that can affect it from moving into the future like it ought to. There are enemies that can damage and cripple the church. Now again... We're talking about where? Who are we talking about tonight? Rising star, right? And if I was in Hamilton, I'd be talking about Hamilton, Texas, but we're in rising star. There are enemies that can kill the church in rising star. There are enemies that can cripple the church in rising star. And therefore, we've got to be ready to fight the enemies if the church is going to go forward. As Terry mentioned earlier, we got to know who the enemies are, right? And my friends, sometimes the enemy are us. If the church is going to move forward in a positive, scriptural way in the future, we're going to have to recognize authority, right? We talked about that in our Bible class. We're going to have to realize that there are challenges that we need to accept. The challenge of making a difference in the world. The challenge of evangelizing our community. The challenge of developing leadership. And the challenging of abiding in God's Word. But also we need to recognize... If the church is going to move forward, there are enemies that we're going to have to defeat. My friends, one of the first enemies that we're going to have to defeat is ignorance. Ignorance comes in many forms. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 22 says, Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that carry the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Here we have reference to the ignorance of the pagans who were making their God out of a tree. Now how dumb is that? They're dumber than a stomp. Making your God out of a piece of wood? We think how ignorant. But today, there are people who worship nature. What is Mother Nature? Look into that. That's... They're making nature a deity. Now, I know we say that sometimes in jest, but be careful. She ain't my mother. People worship crystals. Even today, this very day, there are people who worship idols, worship their ancestors. <clears throat> this is ignorant worship. 
Notice the words of Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 21. Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, that have eyes and see not, that have ears and hear not. This is stubborn ignorance, refusing to listen to God. Isn't it true that we have a lot of people in our world who have that same mentality? Simply refusing to listen to the Word of God. Now we're talking about the enemies of the church. Ignorance. Uh, Hosea chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Hear the word of Jehovah, ye children of Israel, for the Lord the Jehovah hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, nor godliness, nor knowledge of God in the land. You would drop down a few verses to verse 5, verse 6. It says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. They were specifically ignorant of God's word. And Hosea says, this is going to destroy you. And we need to realize also that this will destroy the church as well. Why does error seep into the church? Because people are ignorant of the Word of God. It's a horrible enemy. Ignorance is a real problem. Ignorance will cause us to follow the wrong path. In Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 8 it says, The way of peace they know not, and there is no justice in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein doth not know peace. There are a whole lot of paths that people can follow. But my friends, there is only one path that leads to heaven. There's a song that I really love. It's hard to find it in songbooks nowadays. There is just one way to the pearly gates. I don't know if you'll have it in this songbook, but if you do, I hope you'll sing it. And if you don't know how to sing it, I'll sing it. There is just one way to the pearly gates. Ignorance causes us not to do right. In Amos chapter 3 and verse 10 it says, For they know not to do right, saith Jehovah, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. Did you know that we can do no better than we, do, than we know, right? Somebody says, well, he didn't know no better. Well, how come he didn't know no better? Teach him better. And it's true that we seldom do as good as we know, right? But did you know that ignorance causes God's wrath to come upon us? Zechariah chapter 7 Verses 11 and 12 says, But they refused to hearken, and pulled away the shoulder, and stopped their ears that they might not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which Jehovah of hosts had sent by His Spirit by the former prophet. Therefore there came great wrath from Jehovah of hosts. I don't know about you, I don't want God mad at me. That's not in a good place to be. But did you know that ignorance causes us to be lost? Matthew 13, verse 15. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Thus happily they should perceive with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn again and I should heal them. Ignorance causes us to please ourselves and not God. Do you remember in Romans chapter 10 verse 3 it says, For being ignorant of God's righteousness 
and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. One of the reasons why people are so ignorant of God's Word is because they're more concerned with their own wants than the wants of God. How do we defeat this enemy? Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Now, friends, we're never going to be able to defeat the enemy of ignorance if we don't love God's Word with all of our heart. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13 says, Till I come, give heed to reading, to exhortation, to teaching. Give heed. Some translation says, devote. Consider carefully the need to study God's Word. And you know, this is what's known as an imperative in the Greek. It's not a take it or leave it proposition. <clears throat> this is something you must do, <clears throat> and that is take heed to God's Word. This morning, we talked about 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, the King James translation, study, American Standard, Give diligence. Other stand, uh, under versions will say, do your best to make yourself approved unto God. Great effort has to be set forth in studying God's Word to combat ignorance. But you know, there is another enemy that we're going to have to confront, and that is the enemy of unbelief. You know, many did not realize this, but unbelief is a real problem both for the unsaved and the saved. We forget that. We don't grasp that sometimes. We know John 8, verse 24, he says, except you believe that I am He, you're going to die in your sins. We understand that aspect of belief. That if we don't believe in Jesus, we have no hope of eternal life. Now that's not all of it, but that's part of it. It's a matter of life and death. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled in them that perish, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should dawn upon them. It is a terrible thing to be blind. You know, I don't know what I would want to be taken away, not be able to speak or, or speak or hear, but I have to believe not being able to see would be a lot worse for me. I wouldn't be able to see the beautiful smiling faces of my grandkids, my great-grandchild, my wife even in the morning when she first wakes up. But, how much more terrible is it to be spiritually blind? Satan can blind people to the glory of the gospel. And thus they're going, groping about in unbelief. But I want you to notice this. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, Take heed, brethren, lest haply there shall be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief and falling away from the living God. Now, normally we think about the unsaved as being unbelievers. But here the Hebrew writer is addressing his brethren. He's addressing Christians who were in the danger of unbelief. Unbelief can cause a church to call, can keep the church from moving forward. How might unbelief affect us? If a person knows God's word and yet does not believe it, 
What value will it be in their lives? Thus, for the unbeliever, there will be no desire of complete obedience. There'll be no desire to, to see the need of obedience. I remember one time when David and I were on the radio, and we were talking to a lady named Charlotte. She had a Bible question. We gave her a thus saith the Lord from the Word of God, and here are her words. I know what the Bible says, but I don't believe it. Unbelief. You know, many evidently do not believe that God cares how they live. They lie, they steal. They hurt other people by their speech or by their actions. Some evidently do not believe that God has a plan to save. Some do not believe that it matters how we worship God. Evidently, many Christians do not believe that it matters how committed they are. Hypocrites. Spiritual laziness. We ought to be like the man who cried out to Jesus in Mark chapter 9 and verse 24. It says, straightway the father of the child cried out and says, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Someone once said, be great believers. Little faith will bring your soul to heaven, but great faith will bring heaven to your soul. The sin or the enemy of apathy is another thing we need to be concerned about. A wife once asked her husband, Honey, do you think the world's problems are caused by ignorance or apathy? He replied, I don't know and I don't care. Apathy is very similar to the attitude expressed by the church in Laodicea for which Jesus condemned. He says, you're lukewarm, Revelation 3, 15 through 16. You, you are lukewarm. You make me want to vomit. They were lukewarm. They were lacking passion. They were unconcerned. Judges chapter 5 and verse 23. Curse ye Miraz, says the angel of Jehovah. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not that, to the help of Jehovah, to the help of Jehovah against the mighty. What was going on here? They were neglecting their duties. They would not help God's people. They saw that there was a need. They did nothing. They were apathetic about it. Isaiah chapter 32 and verse 9. Rise up, ye women that are at ease, and hear my voice, ye careless daughters. Give ear unto my speech. What was their problem? They were at ease. They were careless. They were apathetic. Jeremiah chapter 48 and verse 10, it says, Cursed be he that doeth the work of Jehovah negligently. And cursed be he that keepeth back his word from blood. Neglecting their duties. Amos 6 verse 1, Woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. Apathetic. Notice what Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, chapter seven, verse twenty-six. And every one that heareth these words of mine and doeth them not, shall be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. Hears and does not. The foolish man's life was destroyed because of his apathetic. Attitude toward obedience. 
I know you remember what it says in James 2 verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, if a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can that faith, can that kind of faith save him? Faith without works cannot save. James 4 verse 17. To him therefore that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him but is sin. How does apathy destroy us? Why is apathy such an enemy? Apathy causes us to be lukewarm about the church. Not really caring about its purity, its doctrine, its worship. I come just for the good food. I come just for the friendship. I sit on a pew to pay a little fire insurance. Do we really care? This attitude can cause us to be lukewarm about lost souls. People are dying every day without the gospel. Do we really care? Or do we just shrug it off? Oh, there's another heathen that died. Good riddance. Is that our attitude? It can cause us to be apathy. It can cause us to be lukewarm about righteousness. Not really caring. Apathy is a great enemy of the church. And the last enemy I want to talk about tonight is the enemy of sin. This is, of course, the most obvious enemy, right? Sin. But notice, sin happens to people who don't know, who don't believe, and who don't care. Ignorance, unbelief, and apathy all lead to sin. And if the church practices sin, how can we remain the faithful church built by our Lord? The truth is that we can. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 27 says this. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for it, that He might sanctify it, having cleansed it by the washing of water with the Word, that He might present the church to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Christ demands that the church be pure and holy. My friends, this cannot occur when sin lingers. Sin cannot be allowed to go unchecked in the church. If there is sin in a camp, it has to be dealt with. We can't sweep it under the rug. We can't ignore it. Now realize that we have to be patient with people, but we can't put up with it. We can't allow it in the church. We can't allow it in our personal lives. Notice what the Bible says about the enemy of sin. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Therefore let us also, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. A runner does not run a race hampered by weights. You may not believe this, but in my younger days, I ran from the couch to the refrigerator. <laughs> it wasn't my favorite thing to do, but we had to run. And they would put these weights on our legs to run. Have you ever seen any 
Olymp anybody in the Olympics run with weights on their legs? They're not going to do anything that's going to hamper their race. Sin hampers our race. Sin prevents us from winning the race. Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 and 13 says, Take heed, brethren, lest happen there shall be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief in falling away from the living God. But exhort one another day by day, so long as it is called a day, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We need each other. We need each other's help to avoid a heart hardened by sin. If it happens, sin will cause us to leave the Lord. James chapter 5 verses 19 and 20 says, My brethren, if any among you err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he who converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death, and shall cover a multitude of sins. The error of sin can kill the soul. We need each other. Remember, we're a body. Several, mem several members making up the one body. And we need to help keep each other on the right track. I want to go to heaven, don't you? Shake or nod. We need help. I can't do it by myself. You can't do it by yourself. Remember 1 John 3 verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. For the church to move forward, we must recognize and defeat our enemies. Four great enemies. Ignorance, unbelief, apathy, and sin. If we don't do something about these enemies, we are going to destroy the church. But these are enemies we can do something about. There are some things we can do nothing about. But we can do something about these. We are under attack. And we cannot, we must not, Allow the enemy to get a stronghold in our lives. Too much is at stake. Heaven stands in the balance. But you can't even get on the right road if you're not a New Testament Christian, can you? By believing on Him, repenting of your sins, confessing His name and being baptized, Immersed in water for the remission of your sins, the Lord will add you to His church. But we're going to have to remain faithful so as not to lose our place in heaven. If we can help you tonight in any way with your salvation, we encourage you to come while together we stand and while we sing. Isn't it